We are starting a brand new sermon series called Every Day. And you might be wondering, what does that mean? What does every day mean in terms of a sermon or in terms of a teaching? And what we're going to be doing is talking about how you can spend time with God every single day in an intimate relationship with him. And also while doing that, creating habits so that way you don't do it for four days and then just fall off and stop doing it. And with this, with habits, with creating this, it comes with practice. Uh, Who in here practices for a sports team or a band or orchestra, all these things, right? Yes, we do these, and it takes a lot of practice. Um, For me, in specific, it was band. Yes, I was in band. I was, I was in drumline, it was a lot of fun, but with that, it took a lot of practice. Um, I didn't just show up and know how to play any sort of drum just because I had the skill to do it. It started all the way into sixth grade. So before sixth grade, uh, you go to the high school that you are supposed to go to in a couple years, and there's these tables. You go to each table, and it's like, okay, well, this is the trumpet table. You put your name down. Great, next table, do I want to do any of these other things? It's super simple. And then I get to this table a little bit further down the line, and it's for percussion. So with that, there's no one there. There's just a sign-up sheet to come back a different day to try out. So with all the other things, you didn't have to try out. You just show up, you write your name down, and you order your instrument. I didn't know that I had to show up another day to publicly humiliate myself. So you get into this room like a week later, And there's these things called drum pads that are just sitting on stands. There's like 10 of them lined up. And the band director goes, all right, line up. And I'm like, what am I doing? I'm 10 years old and I'm just standing in front of a mirror holding drumsticks that I've never picked up in my life. So he's literally telling us, all right, I want to see you hold a drumstick. Now drop it. Pick it up. Drop it. I felt like I was Karate Kid, like the painting the fence or wax on, wax off. And I'm sitting there and I somehow get like the opportunity to do this. Like they, they said, all right, you pass, you can come and play in middle school. I'm like, yes, score. I was the worst one in the band, the worst. My middle school band director told me that as I was graduating high school. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's hard. I was like, great, that was a 11 year old Austin's dreams crushed. So as I'm going through this, going through middle school band, I'm practicing. I'm going through all the motions, doing all of these things. I'm having to sign off on all of my practice time. So we had these papers that your parents had to sign. Sometimes I would lie and say I practiced for two hours in a day when I, in reality, only practiced for 10 minutes, which might have been the reason why I was the worst. Um, But as I get through middle school and into high school, band kind of shifts. You go from sitting in a chair every single day to then in a field or on a, like a bus lot, carrying the drum, uh, walking for about a couple hours every single day of the summer in like 105 degree weather. So I'm like, oh, I'm not ready for this. This is terrible. I don't want to do this. But with that, I had to practice. I had to get the reps in to carry a massive drum. So I, I did a lot of different things. One of the, my main ones, my favorites, was the bass drum. So it's super simple. You literally just hit the drum like this. It's, it's, I had the biggest one. It was like 30 pounds, and my back was killing me. But It hurts to this day because of that drum. But it was fun. As I gradually got better, as I gradually practiced, I didn't just stand idly by as the worst kid. I made my way up through the ranks. I made it to the top band my last two years of high school. I was one of the top chairs, and and it it was enjoyable once I did the practice. And here's the deal. People who do stuff like this, who, who are in band, who, some, who know a second language, who are really good with a sport, they all have time to work on it and create like their effort for it, for them to get there. You don't just show up, say you do basketball. You don't just show up and you can dunk a basketball day one, unless you're like insanely athletic. But you don't make 10 out of 10 three-pointers immediately. 
People get really good at something whenever they have a lot of reps underneath their belt. And the same is true for people who know God. The same is true who, with people who have a relationship with him. And not, any of us, not that any of us could ever get everywhere, anywhere close to knowing everything that God has to do with you. In fact, striving to know everything there is to know about God may, even be, may not even be the goal. But it would certainly change our lives for the better if we wanted to know Christ more. So in this series, we're going to talk about some steps that we can take to get to know God better. We want to help you try some new things, getting you out of your comfort zone, creating a a lasting and fulfilling relationship with the Lord every single day. And the kind of things that will make your relationship with God a part of your every single day life. So what's the goal? To help you grow a faith that goes with you everywhere into everything. It doesn't just stay with you at your desk whenever you're doing your quiet time. It doesn't just stay with you whenever you're doing your quiet time outside in the nature and watching everything. It's with you whenever you go to work. It's with you whenever you go to school. Whenever you live your life, our goal is for you to live that with a relationship with the Lord. And with that, Knowing God is a lot like knowing people. It's a relationship. You can, you can learn a lot about people, but they surprise you every now and then. With your friends that you have, you might know them for 10 years, and one day you just kind of find out something new about them, right? Super weird. In relationships, you're dating this person, and you're like, I've been dating you for two years, but I found out you like pineapple. I didn't know that. I thought you were allergic, right? It's just random things. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they aren't just puzzles that you put together and that you just are done whenever you're done with it. You're just like, okay, I'm done. Textbooks, you read it. Puzzles, you do it. They're people. They, are, they have emotions. They are a, a living being. And knowing God is the same way. Knowing God is about a relationship. He's not about checking off the boxes. Once you finish that puzzle, you're like, yeah, I'm done. But with God, you're like, no, I'm just getting started. And developing relationships with the people you're around makes sense, right? But building a faith and developing a relationship with God isn't as clear. Sometimes we don't get the exact roadmap. Sometimes we don't get every single decision that's going to happen in our lives. And with that, it might bring up some questions in our life. One, how do you really know God? I mean, you can't really see, you can't really see God the way you see other people, right? Right? You may think that there's a God out there, but, but God is represented and described in so many different ways by so many different people. Which one's right? What do I believe? What do I understand? And how in the world do we as ordinary human beings on this massive planet get to know God better? Second, is it really possible for me to know him? Or is it something that only the super Christians can do? Is it only something that the people who, who strive for it every single day, he wants every single one of you? Or why would I want to know God? What would that mean for my life? Would it make it better or to make it worse? And lastly, would God want to know me in return? I'm a sinner on this planet. I make bad decisions. I do all these things. Why would God want me? Why would he want someone who is so far away from him to be so close to him? And maybe there was a time in your past that you you tried to get to know God. Through all this sin, through all of this stuff in your life that you are living, there might have been a moment that you were like, yeah, I'm going to do it. Maybe you tried to get back into your quiet time or tried to get back into prayer or trying to surround yourself with your community every Wednesday and Sunday and it just grows stale. Now, we might treat getting to know God like requirements, doing homework, studying, brushing your teeth, which I hope you do every single day, doing chores around the house, going to class, watching our siblings' sports games. All the things that you have to do as people. You do all of these things. 
And yet we treat God like we're doing this. Man, I gotta wake up in the morning and do my quiet time so that way I can take a picture and post it on Instagram and then I can leave. Man, I gotta wake up and do my, my prayer so that way I don't have to do it any other time of the day. And that's much different than the way that we think about building a relationship, which is where we should be in that. Spending time together, communicating, being honest, dealing with conflict, having fun and creating memories. The two were just vastly different. And yet we still struggle with that. And I'm not saying that, that relationships are without their fair share of work. All I'm saying is that it's not gonna seem super compelling to know God better when you think of it like doing your homework. Whenever you think of it like you're just checking off that box. And in this series, we're gonna, we're gonna look at how God really wants to have a close, fulfilling, loving, and enjoyable relationship with him, with us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for this time that we just get to, to hear your good news. Lord, that we get to open your word day in and day out. Lord, bless us as we, as we open up into, into Matthew during this time, Lord. And in your precious name I pray, amen. So as we know, the Bible is separated into two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Inevitably, all of them point back to Jesus. And today we're going to be opening up two chapters in the book uh, of Matthew, well, one chapter in the book of Matthew, one chapter in the book of John, but we're starting in Matthew, Matthew 22, verses 36 through 38. So it says, it talks about how Matthew records a scene where a religious lawyer was trying to trap Jesus by asking a question to test his understanding of and commitment in religious law. So it says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? There were a bunch of commandments, right? About 613 of them. Some were do's, do this. Some were don'ts, don't do this. And some of us might even have heard of the big 10 ones, the 10 commandments. And this guy is basically asking Jesus, out of all the big commandments, what is the biggest? What is the one that we should focus on with all of our heart? And there was nothing strange about this question. In the case of religious obedience, people just really wanted to know what Jesus thought was number one. So it says in verses 37 through 38, Jesus replied, love, your Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. According to Jesus, being in a close relationship is priority number one. What are we doing here today? We're trying to help you create that relationship with him. It's the first priority. When you absolutely love someone, you want to be close to them. And that's how God feels about us. God did some pretty awesome things for us in the Bible. And then we get to live it out today. How do we do this? How do we do this? And in this book, in this chapter, we're going to learn. We're going to learn about this today. And during a time when Jesus was talking to his disciples, he explained what a connection of God looks, with God looks like. And in the end, up being the last meal that they share together with him before Jesus died. So as Jesus is passing his wisdom on to them, uh, this is in John 15, verse 5. Um, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Think about that for a second. Apart from, apart from me, apart from, you, apart from our God, we can do nothing. Without him, we have no sustenance. We don't have any fulfillment. And Jesus was so great at using everyday examples to teach powerful lessons. And vines and branches were relevant to his disciples. A vine is a foundation, is the source of life. And in order to, to survive and thrive, the branches must stay connected to the vine. When Jesus said we must remain in him, 
It's simply another way of saying that we need to be connected to him. Why? Because when we do, we produce much fruit. You might have seen this earlier on the, on the table. Um, we're going to kind of give a little visual representation of what this means. Um, where are my scissors? They're there. And with this, Jesus was getting at, and using vines and branches as an example, a branch, bloom, or a piece of fruit cannot exist on its own apart from a vine. It has to be connected to the source of life for it to grow. This plant, this plant right here, represents all of us in our unique God-created differences. Jesus wants to, wants to produce fruit in us. But to do that, what do we have to do? We have to stay connected. We have to meet with him. We have to live with him. We have to embrace him. He is our source of life. We must be connected to him for our source of life. So what happens whenever we're not, right? So I come in here. It's really hard to see. There is a flower blooming right here. I got these from Walmart. Uh, so it's really small. This is a tomato plant. So it's not a flower, but tomatoes start as a little flower. But you see, there's like a little yellow bulb here. Little baby right here. It is gaining its sustenance. It is gaining its nutrients. And what happens whenever I sever it? A murderer. <laughs> How dare you kill that bulb of a plant? So with this, it has no connection to the branch. I'm going to put these down. Uh, no connection to the branch anymore. This flower will not gain its nutrients. Without it, it is lost. It is, it is burnt. It is gone. And the same is true when it comes to our relationship with God, our connection to him. Just like a branch needs to be connected to its source of life to grow, you and I need to be connected with God to keep going and growing in our faith. If we want to know more about God and if we want to, our lives to show it, we have to stay connected with God every single day. And here's the good news. We don't have to figure out how to stay connected to God. Jesus makes that connection possible. He waits for us to meet with him every day. When Jesus died on a cross and rose from the dead, he took away the barrier between us and God. He took away that sin that was in between us and him. He created a way for us to connect with God wholly and directly. And if we stay connected with our God, our lives will show it. Our relationships, our attitudes, our choices, our words will show it. There is no better life than a life connected with God. There is no better life than a life rooted in Jesus. This little bulb, no longer rooted. Apart from him, it is nothing. Apart from him, we are nothing. We can do nothing. And if we want to know more about God, oh, goodness gracious, it just changed. If we want to know more about God and we want our lives to show it, we have to stay connected to him. Just as all of these other branches, all of these other vines are connected, still gaining it, gaining their nourishment, we must stay connected. And Jesus' death and resurrection made this possible. I said that earlier. We have a father who sent his son to die on a cross so that way we may have a relationship with him. And yes, it's not gonna be easy. We are not promised an easy life. We have access to this, but it's not the, the yellow brick road that is in Wizard of Oz. It is not easily uh, passed. It is not very noticeable. Sometimes it's a little, little wobbly. It's not an easy life, but it is a good life. And I can guarantee that a life rooted in Jesus provides us with so much joy than a life without him. We can connect with God every day. So how can, how can we apply this? Let's think about how we're, we're getting to know our close friends, the people that you're getting to know around you in your community groups, in your classes, 
How'd you become friends with them? How did the process get going? Well, when it, when it first began, you were in a small group. You were in a class. You were um, in groups of friends together, but you didn't really know each other very well. And that's it. Maybe you hung out a couple times or you immediately struck up friendship right away. Maybe you were in the same school for years before you actually became friends. I had a friend who I sat next to in a class and didn't talk to him ever in like fourth grade. And then we ended up being really good friends in high school. It took that long for that. It's different for so many people. It can change in different extended lengths of time. And when it comes to getting to know people and getting to know God, you just have to be around God. You're not going to get to know people if you're locking yourself in your room after school, playing video games for eight hours a day. You're not going to have those those opportunities for you to grow in community if you are not seeking the community. It is a step of faith. It It is an action step for you in your faith to do this is an opportunity for you to connect. And how I said earlier, it's it, knowing God is about a relationship. It's not about all those requirements that you have to wake up and do. It's not to check off the box. He wants a relationship with you. It's not one-sided. You're not gonna get there and be like, God, I want you. And he's gonna say, no, you sinned today and you're gonna sin tomorrow. I don't want you. He's there waiting for you to reach out your hands. He's there waiting for you to finally break down the walls of sin that is entangling you in your life. God wants all of you at your lowest and at your highest. And God loves you so much. And he's not gonna make it difficult to connect with you. So let's look back at those questions that I asked in the beginning. One, how do you really know God? Through faith and revelation believing the existence of God and having faith in teachings and scripture and what you learn in the word or personal relationship, actively pursuing him. It's a relationship. It's not one-sided. The Lord is waiting for you at that door. Two, is it really possible for me to know God? Simple answer, yes. We have an opportunity to pursue the Lord with our whole heart through prayer, through communion, through reading, spending time with him. It's a choice. It is a yes that you are giving God. The ball's in your court. He's waiting on you to make that decision. And why would he want to, why would I want to know him? If I'm trying to get there, if I'm getting, if I'm on the way, why would I want to know him? Well, We're promised guidance and wisdom in him. There's a connection and relationship. We have belonging in him. We have safety in him. He's there to protect us and guide us through our sin and our adversity. And if all of these things are there, and they all sound pretty awesome, why are we not taking it? They are there for the taking, for us to just grab and say, yes, Lord, I give you my all. I want this. And yet we're still like, no, I'm not there yet. I don't want that. How? How do we make that decision of turning away from God? The things he gives us is so much better than the things you may think they're better. Our God knows you. He knows what you're doing today. He knows what you're doing tomorrow. That life is better. He's your protection, your nourishment. He guides you. It's there for the taking. And say I get there. Say, say I'm pursuing him. Say I'm breaking down that wall. Would he want me? Yes. Like I've said, it's a personal relationship with each individual. It's supported by so many Bible verses. We're going to get into it. It's rapid fire. Just throwing it at you. Talks about a desire for connection an invitation to have a relationship with him. So in Jeremiah 29, verses 11 through 13, it says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, 
plans to give you hope in a, in a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Emphasis on the all your heart. Don't give him 99%. Give him the extra one. Give him all of you. How about literally in John three sixteen? For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's the story. We live this life today because of that. John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it in full. He's here to give us a full life. James 4, 8, come near to God and he will come near to you. If you meet him there, he will meet you. If you, if you reach this point, he will be there with you, no matter what, no matter the circumstances. And lastly, Revelation 3, 20, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. These Bible verses are a great representation of, of what kind of relationship the Lord wants with us. He knows you. He wants that relationship with you. He wants to commune with you. He wants to pray with you. He wants to rest with you. And these verses and so many others in the Bible convey the idea that God not only wants, but actively seeks a relationship with you. He desires for people to seek him, call upon him and open their hearts to him. We have to meet him there. So that way we may experience his love, his wisdom, his guidance, his blessing. So remember how I was saying that every single day I had to practice, you have to practice for all your sports every single day. Well, we get to meet with God every day. It's not a, I have to meet with God every day. It is a, I get to. I get to sit in the presence of our God and just share my life, to pour out my heart. We get to experience him Remember, we can connect with him every single day through prayer, through reading, through resting in him. And you might see these things and, and think, I don't have any more time to give. I've been in your shoes. The, the answer is yes, you do. You're not as busy as you say you are. You have time in your day. Fix your sleep schedules. Wake up 30 minutes earlier Spend time with the Lord. 30 minutes is not a big difference. I'm sorry. I don't care what anyone says. 30 minutes is not a big difference. You have no excuse. Plan your days well. Go to bed earlier. Spend time with the Lord every single morning. You must create habits and a lifestyle centered around Jesus. He's much better than anything else. A life rooted and abiding in him is much better than any other. And he doesn't expect us to be perfect. You know how I said it wasn't gonna be easy. Well, we're not gonna be perfect. We are human. We mess up, we fall short. And through that, he, he loves us. He's formed us to be the people that we are, the unique children of God that we are. He calls us by name and wants us to be close to him. That's the starting point. Spending time with him. Connection is important to God. And now you can leave here and spend that time and, and understand what it is to be nourished by him, to be loved by him, to understand him. And if this is the first time or the 50th time that you've heard this, I want you to lock in now. We're at the tail end. 
God wants you. God wants a relationship with you. He doesn't care the sin that you live, the things that you go through. He wants you. We have a God who sent his one and only son to die on a cross for you. So that way we don't have to live this sinful life. We can say, God, I want you to have all of it. Lord, I leave this sin at your feet. God loves each and every one of you. He's not leaving you to dry. He's there to pick you up. You must pursue him. And now, as as you head to your small group, I want you to think about this question. One more question. What can you do to make sure you are around God more? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for um, just humbling us today. Lord, speaking through me, Lord, that you are so good. Lord, you are a father who loves us and has freed us from our sin. Lord, I pray that that is understood and that is absorbed, Lord, by these students. Lord, and if anyone is, is interested or has any questions, please, Lord, tug at their heartstrings. Lord, I just pray for them as they go out into their small groups. Lord, I pray that conversations are had. Lord, I pray that walls are broken down. Lord, bless them and keep them. In your name I pray.